The characters we've covered so far in this series have lent themselves to reasonably straightforward evaluation because their stories, even if incomplete, are contained within the game. Now, this isn't true of Marlene. The same applies to Ellie and Riley. But that doesn't create a difficulty. It just, it just poses a question. Do we regard the American Dreams comic as canon? Now, many, perhaps the majority of The Last of Us fans will say, well, yeah, of course, and I wish it was that simple. It would be an emphatic yes if American Dreams was included in the game's packaging or, at the very least, the URL of a site where it could be viewed or downloaded. But this wasn't the case, and that presents a dilemma. Hello everybody, Dino here again, and this time we're delving into the murky waters of Marlene. Now, these waters are extra murky because there's more to her story than we get in the game, and it's a bit of a problem. Call me an old traditionalist, but when it comes to a finished product, I regard it as a finished product. It's self-contained, it should tell you all you need to know. If, for example, a novel is part of a trilogy, the cover will usually tell you, so you know there's more information out there, you know what you're looking for. So, without a rather random internet search, I might never be aware of the comic. So, is it fair that I might spend months, years, evaluating the story, coming up with what felt like watertight conclusions, only for these to be wrong, because they missed information from a source I couldn't be expected to be aware of? Well, in short, no. Now, I've always said that we can regard American Dreams as canon, because patently it is, but with the codicil that we accept it as its own canon. By that, I mean it doesn't matter whether or not we see it as necessary background. It might be true, it might be an alternative truth, a different take, but we should be able to draw our conclusions from the game, and only the game, without fear of being contradicted by arcane information from elsewhere. In fact, for that reason, I stayed away from American Dreams from the moment I was aware of it, which would have been what, about three years ago, maybe longer. It was just on principle. The game changed my life because of what it was, and still is, and it's a very frightening prospect to think that the deep connection and love you feel for a character or characters might be overturned somehow, even if it's because of some minor detail that can still change things. So right now, I'm giving myself a gentle pat on the back because I've been a brave little boy. Yep. A week or so back, I watched the narrated American Dreams on YouTube, and I'm glad I did, because it changed nothing. What it actually did was kind of add substance to what had been vague misgivings about Marlene, but everything had felt like circumstantial evidence. Now, it still doesn't necessarily mean I'm right, but my argument feels just a little bit stronger. Uh, as does my dislike of Marlene. Okay, so this video is not the story of Marlene. In fact, we don't get much of a story. After collecting Ellie, we don't see Marlene again until the end of the game. Now, Joel gets a little information from Ellie as they go to the safe house. When Tess returns to meet them, Ellie asks how Marlene is. There's brief mention of her as they negotiate the trenches. And in the woods, as they get to Billstown, she gets mentioned again. But that's it. It's all very passing stuff. Even so, we do get a good picture of the kind of person Marlene is. And throughout this evaluation of her, it may be a good idea to see her in the context of the Fireflies. She represents them. And in a way, they her. What's clear from the outset is that Marlene has had a senior position in the Fireflies for a long time. In the opening credits, her role as their voice comes at a time when being a broadcast voice is still possible. And the preceding news sound bites tell us the Fireflies have been around for quite some time. Now, we can't be sure about Marlene's earliest involvement, but it wouldn't surprise me if she isn't just their leader she may, in fact, have been the founder. 
uh, obviously we don't know. What we do know is that the fireflies are in a mess and have been for years. There's a desperation in her line, you can still rise with us. It, it carries the it's not too late tone, which points to it being close to the opposite. And the rest, when you're lost in the darkness, look for the light. It may come across as somewhat evangelical, but it's superficial as well. Hardly a compelling message. It doesn't deliver a purpose, doesn't say what the fireflies are trying to achieve. That evangelical tone has been made more interesting, more noticeable, thanks to the second teaser for the sequel, which has some strongly religious overtones. Even Naughty Dog say religion will play quite a significant role. Now, we can do nothing but speculate. But given that the Fireflies had the stated aim of re-establishing government, you'd have thought they would have a lot of public support, especially given the harshness of the military. But that isn't the picture we get. They're struggling. Could it be that the original Fireflies tried to take a moral high ground for which religion would be a perfect avenue, but they began to fracture because of some of their activities which were, let's be honest, not far removed from terrorism? Now, maybe, that's just an idea, the religious cult we see in the teaser may have its roots in the early years of the Fireflies. They're a, a schismatic offshoot. I'm not offering that as a plot theory, by the way. It's just, it's just something that's feasible, nothing else. Should, should we get back to Marlene? The theme of desperation is exemplified from the moment we first see her in the game. Remember, this is the leader of the Fireflies, a group under constant attack from the far more powerful and well-armed military. And as such, she is especially vulnerable. Now, someone in that position a primary target should be in an ivory tower they should be untouchable instead she's injured walking alone in an area which were it not for Tess and Joel would be teeming with the henchmen of a not particularly trustworthy arms dealer let's give her the benefit of the doubt and say that for whatever reason her presence in that manner was unavoidable we'll forgive her and say it was out of her control but you know unprofessional unfortunately within a short space of time she goes all unprofessional again when joel points out way i hear it military's been wiping you guys out oh she really comes back at his jibe with a stinger you're right about that wow marley that told him she's the leader of the Fireflies. If anyone has a duty to present a strong, united image, a front, regardless of facts of course, then it's her. When we reach the woods in Billstown, Ellie says she's stronger than you think. Now if Ellie, a 14 year old girl, has the wisdom to big up this woman she doesn't really know all that well, then it's extraordinary that Marlene can't do that job herself. Instead, she just rolls over as if to say, yeah, we're a bit crap. She can be forgiven for what appears to be the opportunistic approach to Tess and Joel, which leads to them meeting Ellie. The most obvious question is what would have happened if Tess and Joel hadn't been there? In all honesty, I think this is something we can overlook. She may have intended to approach them on a future occasion, but Naughty Dog just needed to keep the story moving along, and this was a simple device to avoid unnecessary filling. What she can't be forgiven for is choosing Tess and Joel. Now, we don't know the extent of her friendship, even if we can call it that, with Tess, but it's clear from the outset that Joel doesn't have a high opinion of her or the Fireflies. And let's face it, Tess and Joel are smugglers. They may be more reputable than Robert, but how well does Marlene really know them? Yeah, okay, so Tommy recommended Joel, but some years have passed since Tommy was a firefly and things change, people change. In any case, Tommy's recommendation doesn't mean Marlene knows Joel. This might not matter all that much, but remember that she's handing over a uniquely precious cargo. If Ellie can provide a vaccine, I doubt that Marlene's primary motivation is that it could save mankind. For her, 
the most important thing is that it will save the fireflies. In other words, they will be the savior of mankind, even if it's a last hurrah for them. But in that sense, Ellie could be Marlene's reputational savior. Tess is doubtless right. They weren't the first or even second choice, but the fireflies can't be so depleted that Marlene would be unable to provide at least a handful of men to escort them to the Capitol building, given just how valuable Ellie is. Now, you're probably thinking the same as me at this point. That would interfere with the story of Ellie and Joel, and it's a fair comment. But all that's needed is for some fireflies to start the journey. Maybe they scout ahead and run into a military patrol, by which point Tess and Joel have gone far enough to know the Capitol building is close and it's not worth turning back. A number of scenarios would work. The point is though, we're seeing more evidence of the reckless Marlene, an increasingly desperate person who seems to have lost the ability to really think things through. But that inability doesn't come from the recklessness. It's something darker and we're starting to close the circle and return to American dreams. And this is where I become nervous about regarding the comic and the game as being of the same canon. Ellie carries a letter, first available to us as she begins the winter segment. It's from her mother, Anna. Now, I used to think, and have to confess I've only partly changed my mind, it may have been forged by Marlene, but there, there's a couple of lines. Life is worth living, and I know you'll turn out to be the woman you're meant to be, which kind of veer away from Marlene's assertion that it's what she'd want, which is what she says to Joel in the hospital. Had the letter indeed been the work of Marlene, I'd expect it to contain some kind of reference to sacrifice, but it doesn't. Now, I'm not completely swayed by that, but, well, maybe that's that could be a subject for another time. Now, there's another line in there. Marlene will look after you. I was always iffy about this, but part of that came from me assuming, via the DLC left behind, that Ellie was effectively raised in a military boarding school, obviously not a place that would open its doors to the Fireflies leader. But American Dreams also paints a picture of a girl who's a bit of a troublemaker, and she's the new girl at the boarding school where she first meets Riley. We have to assume that her behaviour has led to her being shunted around from school to school, and you'd expect that one way or another, Marlene would at least try to ascertain that Ellie is safe, or at least that she's where she should be. The art style of the comics is such that accurately determining Ellie's age isn't too easy, but her dialogue style and overall appearance suggest she may well be 14, possibly 13. Now, on their first escapade away from the school, she and Riley get caught by the Fireflies and Marlene makes an appearance. She knows Ellie by name. But Ellie has absolutely no idea how she could know that. She's never met her before and it's in this part of the story that Marlene gives Ellie the letter. Now, my own daughter at 14 could remember with clarity some of our days out together from when she was seven or eight, and at times she's amazed me by remembering stuff from way before that. Ellie would remember Marlene if the woman had been in her life at any point from when she'd been, what, five or six years old. And what is it she says to Joel at the hospital? I knew her since she was born. I promised her mother I'd look after her. Now, this always sounded questionable at best, and we don't need to rely on American dreams to see how it doesn't add up. Of course, when Ellie tells Joel she's my friend, I guess, on the way to the safe house, we don't have anything to be skeptical about at that point. We might only be wondering why Marlene would entrust Ellie to these two smugglers if she's that important, especially once her immunity is revealed. But in Anna's letter, we read, Marlene will look after you. There's no one in this world I trust more than her. And the next line reads, when the time comes, she'll tell you all about me. Now, if Anna and Marlene really had such a deep friendship, it's not that Marlene would know the contents of the letter, that would be too much of an intrusion, but she and Anna would have agreed to certain things before the letter was written. 
started looking after Ellie, well, that was kind of a given, but she'll tell you all about me is a very personal last request. The only information Ellie gets about her mother, and there's little of it, is through Riley. And even then, it's one option of four if you win the brick throwing game in the mall. Which, by the way, is a rather clever device. It's the only dialogue choice in The Last of Us. And there's a three in four chance we'll have Ellie ask about something else. It kind of highlights how easy it would be for Ellie to never find out anything about her mother. Marlene had a responsibility. She made a promise. And she breaks that promise by consigning Ellie to Tess and Joel and not doing anything to provide them with even the minimum support. The next time we get to see Marlene is at the hospital in Salt Lake City. By this stage, she has effectively dismissed Ellie from her mind, despite her assertions to Joel. And this is where we see her true nature, even if it's one that's a recent development, although I would guess it goes back many years. She's delusional. Let's start by thinking about how easy it would have been for her to have some kind of discussion with Ellie. That maybe it should have been, but it didn't have to be, anything to do with the operation and its consequences. She could have used the opportunity to talk about Anna, as she'd promised, but she didn't. And that was not just deliberate, but I suspect planned a long time ago. Because let's think about Ellie's immunity. What she reveals to Tess and Joel is that she was bitten three weeks earlier. Now, was that the point at which her immunity was discovered by Marlene? Let's play with yes. In that time, a number of things happen. Marlene decides Ellie must be the cure for mankind, albeit without medical evidence. She has to work out a way to get her out of the quarantine zone, arrange a rendezvous with other fireflies and get her all the way to Salt Lake City, presumably with other firefly handovers along the way. In a world without readily available communication, this is a lot of planning in three weeks. And if Robert hadn't betrayed Tess and Joel in such a way that Marlene had been manoeuvred into kind of owing them, who was going to smuggle Ellie out of the city? It seems that by three weeks after Ellie was bitten, Marlene didn't even have that first step planned. What was it, I said, about desperate? Here, apparently, we also have a hell of a lot of reckless. There is a short line of dialogue which vaguely supports this three-week idea when Ellie says Marlene told her, whatever happened to me is the key to finding a vaccine. That kind of refers to when she was bitten. So it could be that Marlene reacted to an opportunity. But it doesn't stop me from wondering if the immunity thing went right back to Ellie's birth. If Marlene made this promise to look after her, why is it that, at least according to American Dreams, Ellie has no idea who Marlene is at the age of about 14? Is Marlene looking after her or merely protecting a commodity from a distance? Ellie was born five or six years into the outbreak, and I think it's fair to assume the degree of societal collapse was nowhere near what it would be by 2033. Many things would still function. Hospitals, for example, and the search for a vaccine would be very active. I imagine every newborn being tested extensively for anything that might suggest a level of resistance to infection. Oh, and talking of resistance, this timescale would roughly coincide with the Fireflies losing a lot of public support and needing to regain it. I have no doubt Anna and Marlene were friends, almost certainly very close friends. And it also seems likely that Marlene, even at that stage, would be in a position where she would be notified about potential vaccines, because success with that would save the Fireflies. Now, the following is not what I claim to be the most likely scenario, but it is plausible, it makes sense. Imagine. Doctors discover Ellie carries what may prove to be the source of a vaccine, and it's unlike anything they've seen so far. But she's too young, and it's in too small a quantity to be useful right now. 
they give Marlene the good news about finding it, but the bad news is that it will be some years, they don't know exactly how many, before what Ellie has reaches its full potential. But there's more bad news, because what they've found grows on the brain, and the only way well, we know the rest. I think Marlene, given the state of the Fireflies, would be sufficiently motivated to want to seize this chance, and in the process, put aside her friendship with Anna. I also think that in securing Ellie for her own future purposes, it would be a, a David-like, by any means necessary. In other words, if that meant creating a false set of circumstances, she'd do it. Anna could be told her baby didn't make it, there were complications, and she could then be shipped off to a distant quarantine zone to start a new life. I, I really can't see Marlene continuing her friendship with Anna while carrying the knowledge of what she'd done. Distance would solve that problem. Or Marlene could simplify things by having Anna killed. Now, either of those could be true, but neither is what I was referring to by a false set of circumstances. That relates to what Marlene would create to cover herself, and it's where the delusion might set in many years later. Because in no way would I suggest she wouldn't feel guilt. Given her closeness to Anna, I imagine that guilt would come by the ton. What she does as a result is create this fantasy world in which she is always the good person. The letter from Anna, faked or not, starts with this negative image of her hating babies. Okay, she goes on to express her wonder, but it starts with the negative. But everything about Marlene is very positive. No one I'd trust more, that kind of thing. By 2034, well, let's just call it the end of the game, she's gone all the way with it, especially with her recordings. In the first of many slightly odd statements is a downright weird one where she says, they want me to kill the smuggler. Why? What possible reason? Joel has crossed America, braving God knows how many dangers to deliver a priceless commodity to them. And all he's expecting is the return of some weapons, and they wouldn't even know that. He deserves their eternal gratitude, not, not to be killed. The two knowing glances Marlene gives to Ethan when Joel wakes up in the hospital, they suggest to me that she's already decided Joel can't walk away, because she knows enough about Ellie's character. She'll be aware that they must have developed at least a very good friendship over their year of travel, which is something her fellow Fireflies won't be aware of. And she already knows, knew from the outset, Ellie was going to die, and that Joel would probably react very badly to that. So in her voice recording, she has to cover herself, point out that she has no intention of killing him, and can only do that by suggesting her comrades, or at least someone else, has said the opposite. Otherwise, it's just a random statement. The most telling pointer towards her delusion is the recording for Anna, and we don't even have to refer to its content. It's the very fact she's made that recording. Oh, and she's made others. We haven't spoken in a while. Whatever happened to Anna happened about 14 years ago. Now, she may have been a close friend, but people were dying all the time. And Marlene must have had other friends who got infected or killed by hunters or whatever. And the difference here is not Ellie. It's already clear that Marlene, to protect herself, has only kept Ellie safe at a distance. There's been no real involvement in the girl's upbringing. And by the time we're at St. Mary's Hospital, she's no longer a name. Marlene only refers to Ellie as she or her, and even, in one recording, the fucking kid. Marlene seems to have created, and constantly lives in, this fantasy world, because it's the only way she can mask the enormous guilt she feels over whatever happened that she was responsible for when Ellie was born. In her own mind, it's quite possible the truth doesn't even exist now. It's total delusion, both amplified and in a way diluted by her obsession with turning the Fireflies from a little militia group 
into the savior of mankind. And that is most clearly shown by what happens at the hospital. Ellie had to be revived, and we know she was, after her near drowning. The Fireflies search for a vaccine, which may have been going on for nearly 20 years, can wait at least another day, or even just an hour or so, if it's to allow Marlene to talk to her. But no, that was never going to happen. It had to be immediate, because if Ellie had asked Marlene certain questions about her own past, well, who knows what that might have done to Marlene. She's so wrapped up in her own delusion, she could easily answer a question with something Ellie would realize was impossible. But as well as delusion, there's straightforward cowardice at work here. Ellie had no way of knowing Marlene would be there. And that was fine by Marlene, an easy escape from responsibility. So there you have it, delusional, obsessed, eager to feed on sympathy, and ultimately far more selfish than Joel could ever be accused of being. That was Marlene, and this was Dino. <laughs> Thanks for watching guys, and see you next time. Ta-da!